Good evening. It's good to see everyone here this afternoon on this uh, perfect weather uh, afternoon. If you wouldn't turn to number 727, we'll sing the first, the second, and the fourth verses of 727. And after we sing this song, Brother Mike Kalinowski will lead us in a word of prayer before we have our class. <clears throat> Though the way we journey may be often drear, we shall see the King someday. On that blessed morning, clouds will disappear, we shall see the King someday. We shall see the King someday. We will shout and sing someday. of your kingdom, Father. We are thankful for all these things. We pray tonight that the message that we learn some things. Dear Father, we pray that you look after all our sick. We have many. You know each and every one of their needs, Father. We pray that you reach down and touch each one of their lives, that they may be a bit more healthy. Dear Father, because we are sinners, as always, the one blessing that always stands out from all the others is the Son that you sent us for our salvation, how he willingly came to earth to die for each and every one of our sins. We pray all these things in your Son's precious name, Father, in Jesus Christ, amen. Some are not able to be here tonight, but <coughs> those things happen. We're glad to have Brother Steve here because we can't be here all the time. We have a visitor. Come on in and sit down. I think I know that fella. Do you have a question? I do. I'm looking for something. If you'll get it. I 
I'm looking for something. Just give me a second here. Hope everyone's had a good week. I went ahead and moved past the uh, uh, the lesson on the church. I figure these questions are things you can study on your own, and um, so we will let that be that. The more I study the Gospel of John, especially when you get up to about chapter 6 or so, we have a very close time frame of events. Sometimes you might read it and say, well, this was over several years. Well, no, these, this section was just over a very short period of time. And the reason I'm bringing that up, if you look at the introduction of uh, Brother Woodson's lesson here, and you have a survey, kind of the, the background for our study tonight, for those who are online watching, we're studying John chapters 14, 15, and 16. The background kind of begins with chapter 8, and really you could go back before that because... You know, in John chapter 6, it's where Jesus is teaching, and he was teaching the, the Jewish people. If you, do, you look at verse 53 of John 6, Truly I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. This is a very strong implication of his impending crucifixion. In other words, you, you're going to have to accept me as the sacrifice for your sins. And if you can't do that, you can't have eternal life. And, and of course, they took him to be teaching to drink blood, which was condemned and, and not allowed by the law of Moses, He's being highly figurative here. Um, and, and so then he says in verse 56, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. In other words, it's a figure, a very powerful figure, strange to the Jews' minds that he, they're going to have to accept him as a sacrifice for sins. Well, they didn't even believe he was the son of God. But, but he's saying, you know, you're going to have to accept this or you don't have life. And so then he speaks to the disciples and, you know, they were talking about what all the people were saying. And he said, well, do you also want to go away? And then you have Peter's answer in verse 68, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. That statement is very critical to what we're going to look at in chapters 14, 15, and 16. Because you know that he would be sending the Holy Spirit, the Father would send the Holy Spirit to his apostles in his name and bringing the word. And so I, I would encourage you, if you haven't done it, read this lesson through and kind of absorb. Brother Woodson was, was a very good teacher. He was one of the favorite I ever had. I didn't get to hear him teach this. I got it out of a book from like 1978, but... It's, it's, really, it's really something to, to study and let the words sink in. He makes some very good points here. And, and the second thing Peter says in verse 69, we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God, as opposed to those who would not accept him and certainly would not accept him as the sacrifice. We're accepting that. You remember the Lord's question to Peter and well, the other, not just Peter, but all the apostles in Matthew 16, about well, who do people say I am, and you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And based upon that, he said, I'll build my church. So you see in chapter 7 that he's teaching at the Feast of Booths, and that was near. We're also very near the Passover. And, and so, the, so when, when the Jews understood that Jesus was really gaining a lot of popularity. He was gaining a lot of attention uh, 
from people. The Jews were jealous. You remember that Pilate knew that Jesus was crucified because of envy. But so, so you see here in verses 40 and following of chapter 7, if the heading of my Bible says there's a division of people over Jesus. And so the, the, the Jewish leaders sent men to talk to him to, and come back and give a report. And the answer was never a man spoke, has, never has man spoken in the way this man speaks, verse 46. There's more to this than there seems to be. He, he, he didn't just heal people, but his wisdom was, there's no one. It's like a greater than Solomon is here. So the Pharisees answered them, verse 47, you have not also been led astray, have you? Now, that's what they thought. They really did not believe that Jesus was the Son of God. And so Nicodemus speaks up. Nicodemus had this conversation, you recall, back in chapter 3. And, and Nicodemus was of the leaders. He was probably in the Sanhedrin. It says, said to them in verse 51, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? They answered him, You're, you are not also from Galilee, are you? That was not meant as a compliment, was it? You, you know, you, but it was a put down. You know what an ad hominem argument is? It's an attack on the person. Attack on the person. That was kind of what this was. And then in chapter 8, you've got this record of the adulterous woman that they bring in here to Jesus. Said what well, They were testing him again. What are you going to do about this, Jesus? She's caught in the very act of adultery. Isn't it interesting that they didn't bring the man? They had an ulterior motive here. And this is not a lesson on how he dealt with that. You can study that. Obviously, he told her, and he didn't condone what she did. Um, but he wasn't condemning her. And you need to just look into the depth of it. What she did was wrong. But then again, how did they know what was going on? See, and, and obviously there was something that went on that's not recorded here because Jesus says in verse 11, I do not condemn you either. Uh, there's no one here to condemn you, verse 10. From now on, sin no more. In other words, don't do this. So she obviously did, but they didn't have the man. And then Jesus talks about being the light of the world in John chapter 8. And he, and he, he, and, it, and there's one thing about John. There's a lot of talk about the light. There's a lot of talk about truth. And that John 14, 6, I am what? The, way, the, way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the <clears throat> Father except through me. Notice verse 26. He says, I have many things to speak and judge concerning you, but he who sent me is true, and the things which I heard from him, these I speak to the world. And they were talking, he was talking about the Father, but verse 28. When you lift up the Son of Man, see, he's very, very close time-wise to his crucifixion. When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he. There was something about the crucifixion that could be very obvious. Do you remember when he died that one of the Roman soldiers confessed that well, obviously, this was a son of God. That, and that event captured people's attention. That what kind of actions would you be getting from an ordinary person on a cross? Well, they, they might be trying to defend themselves. I'm innocent. I didn't do this. I don't deserve this. Please release me. Or curse those who are doing this to me. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, he didn't do anything. no, you had the. He prayed for him, in fact. 
Yes, and they heard him praying to God too, didn't they? I'm sure they've never heard that. <laughs> and it's like, this is no ordinary person that's being crucified here. There's, I wish I could have been there, you know, but we have scripture and it's sufficient. Notice verse 29. <clears throat> well, let me finish. Verse 28. You'll know that I am he, and I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father taught me. This leads up to some things that Jesus keeps repeating. There's, there's several things that he is saying here that he talks about truth, he talks about teaching, he talks about the Father teaching him, and I share with you what the Father has said to me. He talks about his, his he talks about his death. When you lift up the Son of Man was an expression for crucifixion. That's the way people died that were crucified. They were lifted up. And notice he said, as I speak these things, as I speak these things as the Father taught me, verse 28, and he who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone. And that is so powerful to know that Jesus, he, he cried out to the Father on the cross, but the Father has not left him alone, for I always do the things that are pleasing to him. There's nobody who ever lived other than Jesus who could say that? Nobody. You might say, I always try, but you're probably lying then. I'm not trying to point fingers, but sometimes we don't try, do we? Be honest. Sometimes we don't try. But as he spoke these things, many came to believe in him. There's, there's a faith building going on here. Jesus knew what he was doing as he spoke these things publicly. And then you get down here, verses 31 and following, about knowing the truth. And the truth will make you free. Now, hold on to that as we get into 14, 15, and 16, because he calls the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth. So there, there's, I'm bringing all this in here for a reason. But he says, if you continue in my word, then you are truly my disciples, or truly disciples of mine, or my disciples indeed. And I think, okay, so how many of you ever went into something that you had to study to do? Like, anybody ever take karate or anything, or you go out for wrestling in school or basketball or football that's a there's some discipline involved in that isn't there mike and and if you want to be continue to stay on the team you've got to continue practicing and and, and learn listening to your coach and and try maybe watching films sometimes they used to uh you to be a basketball player you have to maintain the discipline and so jesus is saying you'll be my disciple you have to continue in my word. I want to be a disciple of Jesus as long as I live. But don't, how can I, there's only one way I can do that. That's not just come in here and sit down, but come in here and learn for myself what and who I need to be to listen to Jesus. And then he says, and then you will know the truth. Truth was revealed little by little by little. And then over time, and see, even if you get over here to chapters 14, 15, and 16, you're going to see how Jesus talks about the Spirit, and he will teach you all things. He'll bring you remembrance, your, your remembrance, all things I said to you. He will teach you things to come. So, you, But you've got to maintain this discipleship. You have to keep listening to my word. How many of you know more today than you did the day you were baptized? Yeah. But what happens if we slack off a little bit, Tony? We, we start slipping and, and forgetting. We forget. I was talking with Brother Mike Hickson today about some things. And when he and I went to school together, it was our desire to be preachers. And I did that from 86 to 94. And then I went into mission work. 
And I wasn't in a pulpit all the time. And so, but Mike has stayed in a pulpit or a classroom from then until now. I said, you can reference scriptures better than I can because you stayed in that. I said, I've had to work hard since I've gotten back into full-time preaching and teaching. And I said, it's, I'm doing better, but it takes time and it takes effort. And, and so we call each other and we talk and we just talk Bible. What are we doing? We're learning together. You know, we, we were talking about the Paul's man of sin and 2 Thessalonians 2. And it's like, well, who is it? Well, whoever it was, was already at work. Paul said he was, so it's not somebody in the future. We learned that much, but, but that's, just, that's learning, isn't it? That's understanding. And, but then knowing the truth will make you free. And we'll talk more about that. And, but then ultimately, it's the son who makes you free, verse 36. Everything from Genesis to Revelation is ultimately about God's scheme of redemption through his son, Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Some people, I was talking to Mike today, I said, we got like three lessons left for the students in school. I said, let's talk about the Godhead because some people don't believe in the deity of Christ. They don't believe in the deity of the Holy Spirit. Well, this, this lesson will talk about the deity of the Holy Spirit. And I said, you know, he's not God's active force like our Jehovah's Witness friends believe. He's God. I tell people this. I don't have to understand everything about God to know that he is. I don't have to understand how deity indwelled a human being but it, do, it did the Holy Spirit caused Mary to be with child that's the God side Mary was human that's the human side how did he do that I don't know how did God make the world how did he make dirt come alive in Genesis 2 and verse 7 I don't know but I know he did Yes, sir. You know, even though there will be those things we can't completely understand, we have the assurance that we have everything we need for life and godliness. Yes. yes. Now, Jesus has a conversation here with the, the, the Jews, and, and they're, they, they buck him all the way because they do not believe he's the, the Messiah, the Son of God, they killed him for blasphemy. He wasn't guilty, but they killed him for that. And so you have this conversation. He tells him, verse 44, you are of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. <clears throat> so if they're following the devil and he was a murderer from the beginning, what's he implying here? That's what they're going to be. Jesus was murdered. He was not justifiably put to death. And says, because I speak the truth, you do not believe in me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? Boy, that's a strong statement, isn't it? If I speak the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears the words of God. For this reason, you do not hear him because you are not of God. Now, I'm looking at that verse for a reason. Because... Those words were not just left when Jesus was crucified and went back to heaven. The Holy Spirit in these verses that we're going to look at, make, God made sure through the Holy Spirit that these words would continue to be available for us. And so he talks a lot, you know, as he talks about that a lot, and then he says, Verse 51, truly, truly, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death. Now, they said, now we know you have a demon. Well, Jesus, God, they look at death differently than we do. 
James tells us that the spirit, the body without the spirit is what? It's dead. But what about the spirit? It continues. What is it Ecclesiastes 12, 7? The dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. If you are a faithful Christian, you are continuing to be a, a disciple of the Lord by abiding in the truth. You will never see death in the sense that we might describe it. If you die faithful, will your soul die too? Death means separation. It does not mean cessation of existence. Now it does for a dog or a cat or any other <coughs> animal, but for us, it's a separation of the body and the spirit. And so if you're faithful, when you die, you'll be like Jesus told the penitent thief, today you will be with me in paradise. In that sense, you won't die. <coughs> That's comforting. But all of this, all of this depends on Jesus says, you must keep my word. Keep my word and that'll be good. Then they, they said he was crazy, you know. Well, then what does he claim in verse 58? Truly, truly, I say to you before Abraham was, I am. John begins with that thought. In the beginning was the word. I was discussing this with a person on Quora the other day. And I don't deal with all the questions, but I deal with some. I pick and choose. He was saying that Jesus was not God. I said, yes, he was. And if you say he's not, you're going to lose your soul. I told him that. Jesus said, unless you believe that I am, you'll die in your sins. Jesus was claiming deity in John 8:24. Because John said in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. I don't know a lot of Greek, but I know this. The Word was, was in the durative imperfect tense. What the scholars say that means, whatever was, always was, and always will be. So, the eternal Word became flesh. Jesus was God in the flesh. And if you deny it, you'll lose your soul. He said so. But even more so, he's claiming deity to these Jewish people. The, the claim was true. Whether they accepted it or not. I want to say this, brothers and sisters. I don't care what the world says. If you know something is the truth, you hold on to it. Because your life depends on it doesn't it? I don't care what the world says. And so they picked up stones to throw at him. Listen, <clears throat> they might have killed him physically, but you can't kill God. Matter of fact, Jesus would say in John, is it, is it, is it 10? I mean, Matthew 10, 28, about those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but fear him who is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. So the word destroy there does not mean uh, annihilation, by the way. It has a different meaning. But Jesus survived, and this is what's important. Jesus is going to survive the crucifixion by resurrection. You will survive in eternity by resurrection, and I will, if we hold on to his word and we're faithful. Remember John 5, 28, 29, flip back a couple of pages. What he said, um, do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. That's everybody who's ever died. And they will what? Come forth. Those who have done good deeds to a resurrection of life. Those who have committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. So there's another encouragement for the person who's living for the Lord. It's a resurrection to life. And so you, you come back over here and then you get to chapter 9 where he heals a man who's born blind. Well, boy, that caused a ruckus. And so the people come after him, you know, and the man really didn't know who Jesus was. He said, all I know is that he may, I was blind and now I see. 
I figure in time he figured it out. Remember, this is all new stuff to people. Some of these people, it's their first encounter with Jesus. It's not like 2,000 years of history. And then, uh, so then you get over here to chapter 10, you have the parable of the good shepherd. And look at verse 10. The thief comes only to steal, steal, and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I'm the good shepherd. The good shepherd does what? Lays down his life for the sheep. That's not just a maxim of truth. He's talking about himself. I'm going to lay down my life for my sheep. I want to be one of his sheep. Some people make fun of us. God never makes fun of his people when they're faithful. Jesus is at his right hand watching everything we do. So there goes my sheep. He also sees when we go astray, doesn't he? But he, he laid down his life for us. Did you, you see how this just keeps coming up? The, the impending death because it's very soon. Very soon. And, and so you get down here to verses... Uh, 17 and 18, for this reason the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. No one has taken it from me. That kind of explains the cross, doesn't it, Steve? Yeah. He willingly went, but I have authority to lay it down. And I have authority to take it again. This commandment I received from my Father. The crucifixion was the end in the mind of many people. Some of the disciples weren't sure. Thomas wasn't sure. Jesus was. And he knew he would be back. So, but you see, verse 19, there's a division that occurred because of these words among the Jewish people. There again, they say he has a demon. He's crazy. He's insane. Why do you listen? Why do you listen to this? You really think if he's put to death, he's going to come back? If he's God, he will. What did I just say? If he's God, he will. That's important. If this is deity, he will. And only deity can bring people back to life. Then you get over here to book of verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Question. Where is the voice of the Son of God today? In the scriptures. In the scriptures. And that's what John 14, 15, and 16 is going to help us with. And, and, and without looking at the details, it's a wonderful read to read all of this. But, you know, the Jews were, they would have killed him earlier if they could have. They would not have waited. Uh, Crucifixion was a part of God's plan, but if they if they could have gotten to him, they would. And Jesus eluded them; he left at times. <laughs> so they were trying to kill him, but he knew God's plan. And then you've got chapter eleven, Lazarus, Lazarus, a man who's been in the grave three days. Without looking at the details, Jesus comes after Lazarus has died, and what he says three words. Lazarus come forth. Lazarus come forth, and he came out of that grave. There was a reason that Jesus waited. Jesus could have gone there and prevented Lazarus from dying. He could have. Like his sister wanted. Yeah. But see, he had a purpose. God had a plan. God doesn't just haphazardly do things. He had a plan. And so he waited for him to die. And then what did he do? He came back and said, okay, Lazarus, this man's been in the grave three days. And they said, by now there's a stench. Well, naturally, they didn't embalm people. And he came out. And they took the grave clothes off of him and he was just alive again. The reason was to show if I have power over that, I've got power over this body. You get chapter 12, 
Uh, now, now, I was slow, let me slow down here. Look at verse 55. You've got to see this. Now the Passover of the Jews was near. What does that mean? What's going to happen on the Passover? But yeah, but what, what significantly happened on this Passover? Supper. Jesus' crucifixion. Yes, the Lord's Supper. Oh, okay. Yeah, but you're right, the Lord's Supper. And then they, they sacrifice a lamb. lamb, who is the Lamb of God. Oh. Really, this time, the last Jewish Passover, Jesus taught them. And so, but, the, but it's near. See how these, the, these events are closer than they may seem if you kind of put it together. And so look at verse 1 of chapter 12. It's six days before the Passover. That's one week before that he's crucified. So then you get over here. You got to keep reading. He comes into Jerusalem. The Greeks are seeking him. And he foretells his death. Um, and, and, and he's praying here. Look at verse 27 of chapter 12. My soul has become troubled. He's, it's on the inside that he's struggling. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. That's the same thing you read about in the Synoptic Gospels, so what went on in Gethsemane. Let me tell you something. I have read this and read this and read this. I know that he knew that he was going to die. He's been, he's been talking about it. And I think what, why it's hard for me to understand why he prays this, I do not believe that he was praying for God to remove the suffering. Now, he was fully human, but there was something that happened between him and the Father. So I have some brethren that I respect greatly. They say that the Father did not leave Jesus. Look, he took sin upon himself, and he let him die. He let him die. And, and sin does what? Between humans and God. Separate. Separates. Separates. Right. It may have been brief. I do not believe the prayer was about how bad this crucifixion is going to be. You watch his actions. And the whole time he's been beaten and he's on the cross, you don't hear any complaining. It's, it's a spiritual depth that we cannot plummet, that we'll never understand unless we understand it in heaven. But that relationship, when Jesus prayed that all would be one in John 17, 21, as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that had to have been a vital part of this. You ever hear people talk about those folks are tight? Well, there's nobody as tight as the Godhead. Nobody. And, and obviously, that's what he was struggling with. you have your hand up, Steve? I, just, I think part of his anguish was knowing that at least briefly there was going to be a separation for the first time in his, in his existence or in eternity. <laughs> now, I said this was the same prayer that was in Gethsemane. I don't believe it was the same time. It's the same prayer. But people heard this. Look at verse 29. The crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. That's when the Father spoke to him. And so this is the same prayer, but it's not the same setting. Okay? Now, um, you get over here, verses 47 and 48. Put 47 and 48 of John 12 in the historic context and setting. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I do not come to judge the world, but to save the world. That doesn't mean Jesus is not judged. It's, it's, it's like, um, I didn't come here for that purpose. I came, my purpose in coming was to save. Now you look at verse 48. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one that judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. 
So who's the judge according to John 17, 31? It's Jesus, isn't it? But his purpose in coming was not to judge, but to save. That's the primary purpose. It's, it doesn't mean that he's saying that people are sinless. He said, I'm not here to judge at this point. I'm giving people the opportunity to be saved. That's why I came. And But there would come a time for judgment. And then he mentions again, I did not come to speak, the move verse 49, of my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a command what I should say and what, I, what to speak. And so the Father and Jesus are working together in all this, and in a few minutes you'll see the Holy Spirit getting involved in it after he leaves. He says, I know that his commandment is eternal life. What does God want for people, Mike? Eternal life. That's what he wants. It really is. He doesn't want people to die lost. He doesn't want people to go to hell. He doesn't want people to live a reckless, fruitless, difficult life here. And I'm talking about due to sinful things. I'm not talking about just bad things happen to good people, but he wants us to have a, a good a good, a good life. That's what he said. I came to bring life. And, and I believe in when he said that in John 10, 10, that a better life now and certainly a perfect life in eternity. Mm -hmm. Now, but so, and so then he says, therefore, I'm, looking, I'm still in verse 50 of John 12. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. And I'm thinking, okay, so the Father has told him what to say. Listen, Jewish people. We're all Jewish people, Jesus would say. I'm not speaking from myself. The Father's telling me what to say. God the Father's telling me what to say. And you know one of the reasons that they could know that was because of his miracle. And that's why John closes the way it does. It's like there are many other signs that Jesus did in the presence of his disciples that are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe, and that believing you may have life in his name. So the signs would show that the words were true. In John 13, you have the, last, the Lord's Supper. This is John's account of the Lord's Supper. And so whatever this prayer was, was before the Lord's Supper. The other prayers in the Synoptic Gospels are after that, aren't they? They're after the Lord's Supper and before he's arrested. So, so here is, this is John's account of what took place at the Supper. You know, that's where he washed the disciples' feet. And I'm going to have to stop here in a minute, but I'm kind of laying a foundation before we get into the chapters 14, 15, and 16. Um... Verse 21 of chapter 13, when Jesus has said this, he became troubled in spirit and testified and said, truly, truly, I say to you that one of you will betray me. So he is here with his 12 disciples and he's washed their feet. And, and one, of these, uh, one of these men is going to betray him. Well, we know who it was. And we know it was Judas. And it bothered Jesus. Listen, there's not a soul that sins that doesn't bother God. Because sin separates people. It hurts God. He doesn't want us to be separated from him. He doesn't want us to live in rebellion. He wants us to be lovingly obedient and faithful. And it bothers him. It ought to bother us when it bothers God, shouldn't it, Steve? We know it does. And so, of course, they start looking around the room because there's not a soul there planning to do that except one. So naturally, we would, well, who's going to do that? Who's going to, you know? And Jesus didn't say a word about it, did he? He didn't reveal who it was. Um, it kind of did, but I still, I don't think they, I don't think they, they caught it. What did he do? 
Sir? They said what you do, do quickly. Yes. But, you know, so Judas is left. And so some were supposing because Judas had put in the money box that he was saying to him, buy things that we need for, for the feast. So they didn't. They still didn't catch on. But we know what Judas did. Now, I want to look at verse 34 before we stop tonight. And then we'll pick up with chapter 14 next week. In verse 34. Jesus has moved from talking about his death, his sacrifice of himself, from talking about truth. Now he's applying truth. I've sh told you the truth. The Father has told me what to say. I've shared that with you. You abide in my word. You're my disciples indeed. Well, that's easy. Okay. But then you start applying that. That's very different. A new commandment I give to you, verse 34, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. I want you to think about this before we finish this lesson tonight. That of everything that Jesus did up to this point, it was more than teaching. He had put up with James and John and Peter and, and these guys and and he put up with a, a lot of the Jewish people, and but he had patiently taught and guided and shown them how to talk to people like the woman of Samaria, how to go home with somebody like Zacchaeus, how to do the things that God wanted him to do. <coughs> he was sinlessly perfect. They weren't. And then they come to the Passover and for whatever reason, everybody's got dirty feet. I, I, I don't know. Maybe somebody can explain that to me. Maybe it's not abnormal, but I don't think it was. Or Jesus wouldn't have taken advantage of it. For some reason, their feet were dirty. Maybe they got too busy. I don't know. Regardless, maybe that was normal that they hadn't done that. Jesus still got down and did the work of a household slave. If you want to be served, if you, okay, you ain't going to keep my word. One of the ways you do that, be show up at church on Sunday, make sure you take the Lord's Supper. Hope you didn't forget your collection, your, your contribution, and make sure you speak to people and be good this week. Is that kind of the way a lot of people look at Christianity? A lot more to it than that, isn't there, Lenny? It's serving one another, helping people. And so... We'll pick up with verse 14. Uh, go ahead and do, do yourself a favor and read now what we kind of scanned over. Go back to chapter 6 and read up through chapter 13 and see if it won't help you as we get into these chapters. We're going to do the invitation and then we'll shut off the phone. I read about a man who needed a dual lung transplant. He was really in bad shape, but he understood that a donor could help him with that, a lung donor, but he also understood that a lung donor would have to die in order for him to get a lung or get two lungs. Somebody's going to have to give up their life for that. And I think the first one to do that on behalf of another was Jesus. In John chapter 12 at verse 24, Jesus is speaking to his disciples and truly, truly, and whenever Jesus says truly, truly, or your old King James Version would say verily, verily, which is an old word for truly, 
I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. What an illustration. A seed can holds within it the germ of life. And I have saved, and you have two seeds from maybe watermelons or whatever plant, and maybe you let you then the next year you put that in the ground and it brings out whatever that seed came from. Jesus says, but that seed has to die. The seed loses itself in order to produce life. And Jesus says, he's talking about himself. I'm going to have to die. But by my death, by my, he's, he's being figurative here, by my death, there will be much fruit come. When you get a chance, read Isaiah 53, but read it all the way through, and you get down to the end of it, and it all turns out happy. There's fruit that comes forth from the death and the resurrection of Christ. And so Jesus died so that we could have life. And that seems contradictory, but it's not because after he died, he, he came back, didn't he? And that's what gives us hope of life. But what do, you, what do you and I have to do? We have to die to ourselves. John, Paul talked about that in Romans 6, didn't he? He talks about <clears throat> baptism, but he's really talking about death in Romans 6. What kind of people do you bury? Dead, people. Dead folks. What kind of people should we be immersing? Dead folks. Some of the Christians in Rome had either forgotten that or missed it or, or whatever because they were continuing in sin. They weren't dead to themselves. Unless a grain of wheat falls in the earth and dies, it remains alone. It's worthless. It's not doing anything. But if it dies, it'll bring forth fruit. So Jesus died so we could have life. We died of sin so we can have life. And I think, what a wonderful thing. I appreciate people who put organ donor on their driver's license. I, I have that on mine. And uh, so if, if somebody needs a, something that I have that's functional, fine. But that won't give them eternal life. That took Jesus, didn't it? That took Jesus. But here's the question. Are you dead to yourself? Am I dead to myself? That's a hard question, isn't it? Am I really dead to myself? I'm not talking about sin as perfection, but a desire to for that, put that old man to death and, and live for the Lord. Because unless a grain of wheat falls in the earth and dies, it remains alone. And that's why Paul had to write Romans 6. Because they were still, some of them still living, living in sin. I want to show you one more passage. In Romans chapter 6, he says, but in verse 16, he says, Do you not know that when you present yourselves to someone as slaves for obedience, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin resulting in death or of obedience resulting in righteousness? But thanks be to God. Though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. So there's a form of teaching that a person must hear. For those who may be listening online, what is that form of teaching? Well, part of it included baptism. That's what he was talking about here. That's not all, though. Repentance is death to self, death, death to the idea of wanting to live for yourself and live for the devil. And belief in Christ is essential. Confessing him is necessary, that he's the son of God. And not only that, but Romans 10, 9 says we must confess him as Lord, our Lord, and then be baptized for the remission of our sins. And when you come up out of that watery grave of baptism, if we've gone through faith, confession, repentance, and baptism like we should, we come out born again, renewed, forgiven. But we have to die to self. 
So there's some people that won't submit to that because they're living for themselves and they don't want to give up something. Give it up if God says to. That's for me too, right? You need to respond to the Lord's invitation. It's always his as we stand in Tony Lee's. Sinner Jesus will receive sound the word of grace to all who the heavenly pathway leads all who linger all who fall sing it o'er and o'er again Christ receive Yeah. <laughs>